Well, good evening. Glad you could be with us tonight as we continue to look through the book of Genesis. Um, we looked at chapter 1, didn't read every verse, but we looked at um, the overall story of Genesis 1, that God is the one who created um, everything from nothing. He created the world, everything that's in it, including mankind, and we got that in the week in Genesis chapter 1. Genesis 2, we have a, um, a more, I believe, uh, some people think that this is a second account of creation, that um, Genesis 1 tells of creation from millions of years ago, and then Genesis 2 talks about the creation of Adam. Uh, but I believe it's just a recap of what happened in Genesis chapter 1. And we talked about several of the reasons for that. But we're going to look at Genesis 2 tonight, which will give us a little more detail, especially into the creation of man. And uh, not just the creation of man, but the creation of marriage, which was the first thing that God, first institution um, that God set up is marriage. And we'll look at that in a week or so. But we're going to look at one verse tonight, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you tonight for your word. We thank you for this opportunity to be together. Thank you for the way you've provided for this, that we could, uh, your word could be shared uh, this way. We pray, Lord, tonight as we look to your word that you would help us to rightly divide it, that you would be glorified, and we pray that you would strengthen us, encourage us, convict us, bring us closer to you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I heard a story about a, um, a little boy who was in elementary school and he was supposed to take his birth certificate to school um, and his mother warned him about it you know you need to be very careful with this document because it's a it's a very important document and you don't need to lose it and as little boys do he took it to school and he did lose it and his teacher found him and he was crying and she asked what's wrong and the little boy said, I lost my excuse for being born. Well, too often we can do that. And we're going to talk about tonight not losing your excuse for being born. Some of us have lost maybe the reason to live. Why were we created? Why are we here? And we're going to look at that uh, tonight. First of all, man was created in the image of God. We talked about that in uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 through 31. And part of that image of God, and I alluded to this before, but part of that image of God is the, the triune, I believe, image of God. God is uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And man is um, body, soul, and spirit. I believe man is triune in that way, and we're going to look at that tonight. The body, um, our unbelievable body. You may be like me and not be too excited about your body, but your body is an unbelievable and amazing thing. And if you look at just, and we're going to look at just a couple of simple things tonight, um, and I'm going to give you some a few figures. If you look at just these few things that I'll we'll talk about tonight, how you could believe that that we just happened by accident is um, is beyond me. But anyway, um, I want to look at first of all about our unbelievable body. I want us to look at the commonness of it. Our body is made up of about a hundred and two minerals. Our body is made up of different gases, uh, about 65% oxygen, 18% carbon, 10% hydrogen, 3% nitrogen. Uh, the body has enough carbon in it uh, to fill about 9,000 lead pencils. There's enough fat in the average adult body to make about seven bars of soap. Uh, 
if you're like me, you may get a little more than seven bars. But anyway, um, all of these things are found in the earth. Just minerals, things that are found in, well, in the dust. Carl Sagan, who was, a, I think, a very brilliant man, if we can say it this way, he was brilliant in the things of man, but he was, um, I think, willfully ignorant of things of God. And Carl Sagan was a physicist and a scientist, and he had a show years ago on public television called The Cosmos, and he talked about the, the universe and how it started. And of course, he believed it all started with a big bang and uh, millions of years and all that sort of stuff. But the, the fact that he said this, he said that the, the universe, and he talked like that, the universe is made up of this dust, that we call star stuff. And he said the, the stars and the planets and all the, everything basically in the universe was made up of this, what he called star stuff. But he said the amazing thing about it is our bodies are made up of this same star stuff. And I thought that's in chapter two. I mean, you didn't have to go far to find that, that we're made from just the simple elements in the earth, the commonness of our uh, bodies. But not only the commonness of our bodies, but the complexity of our bodies. The a protein, and now this is stuff, I, I don't know this stuff, I looked this up from science web pages. Um, the protein molecule is made up of uh, this one particular uh, thing is, uh, that makes collagen is made up of 1,055 amino acids. Well, each one of those amino acids have to get in line in the right order for it to make a collagen protein. The author, which was not a Christian, described this as it would be like a slot machine with 1,055 little windows and every one of those windows would have to line up in the right place for that to make a protein, a collagen protein molecule. The complexity of our bodies, not just the commonness, but the complexity of it. The surface area of a human lung is equal to that of a tennis court. Can you think of that inside your body? Um, when you smile, it takes about 30 muscles uh, to smile. Our blood circulates on a 60,000 mile journey. The, our eyes are so complex, they can distinguish up to one million color surfaces and take in more information than the largest telescope known to man. The ear, if you're hearing me right now, is a intricate device of nerves and uh, membranes and bones and that allow us to hear the complexity of our body. No wonder the psalmist said, I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. So we're created in the image of God. God formed a man and he made him a body. And what a unbelievable body it is. It's common and yet so complex. Secondly, man is not only a body, but man is a soul. I want us to see the unity of the soul. Um, the soul is the person you really are. Uh, you've never really seen me. You see the shell, the house that I live in. The soul is the person you really are. The, uh, well, I believe the soul is in three parts. The mind, the emotion, and the will. Um, it's that person who you are. And that person, uh, your soul, I believe, will go on forever. First, your soul is made up of your mind, your 
thinking processes and the way you um, know things. In that verse I shared with you in Psalm 139, um, the psalmist says, I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works and that my soul knoweth right well. So we know with our soul, our mind. Jeremiah wrote in Lamentations, my soul hath them still in remembrance and is humble in me. So with our soul, we know. With our mind, we know, which is part of our uh, soul. Solomon wrote in Proverbs, when wisdom entereth into thy heart, the knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul. So with our soul, with our mind, we know things, um, not our bodies, but with our mind, with our soul, we know things. Our soul has to do with our mind. Our soul also has to do with our emotions. Um, the Bible says, uh, talking about David and Jonathan, that David and Jonathan were such friends that the Bible says that Jonathan loved David as his own soul. So it's not only our mental uh, capacity, but our emotional capacity as well. In the book of Song of Solomon, chapter 1, O thou whom my soul loveth. So our soul is that part of us that not only thinks but loves. And in 2 Samuel chapter 5, David talks about those who his soul hates. And so we have both the mind, the thinking, but also the emotional part of us is our soul, part of our personality. Uh, the Greek word in the New Testament for soul is the word we get our word uh, psychiatry, psychology uh, from that deals with the whole person. Uh, so the soul has to do with the mind, the soul has to do with emotion, the soul has to do with the will. We decide what we will do. Uh, David says, um, deliver me not over unto the will of mine enemies. And that word will there is translated here will, but it's the same Hebrew word that's translated soul in Genesis chapter 2 that we read. Also in Psalm 41, David says, for the Lord will preserve him and keep him alive and he shall be blessed upon the earth and thou wilt not deliver him unto the will or the soul of his enemies. We have an unbelievable body, the commonness of it, the complexity of it. We have a unity in our soul of who we are, our mind, emotion, and will, the person we are. And that's who God created. When God created us, he formed Adam and he breathed into him the breath of life and he became a living soul. Sometimes soul and spirit are used interchangeably, but they are different. Now what happens to your spirit will happen to your soul as well. Um, but they are, I believe they are a different part. Uh, we have a body. Plants and animals both have bodies, but only animals and man have a body and a soul. I believe that animals have a soul, not in the sense that we think about a soul as in being eternal, but they have a mind, emotion, and will. If you doubt that, you uh, have never tried to plow with a mule before. They have a will and a temper. Uh, they have emotions, too. I don't know much about the mind, but they they have a soul, uh, a, a psyche. But man is the only creation of God that has a body, a soul, and a spirit. Man is the only one who has a spirit, and with that spirit, we can know God. When the angel came and spoke to Mary, and then Mary went to see Elizabeth uh, about 
them both having a child when it was impossible really for them to have a child. Um, they praise the Lord. Mary says, my spirit hath rejoiced in God, my Savior. So with the spirit, we know God. And that's different than the other animals. Uh, other animals don't know God. And we can know God because we have a spirit. And we are different that way. Jesus met, we call, the woman at the well in um, Sychar, in the Samaritan area. Uh, we call her the woman at the well at Jacob's well. And he met her and they talked there and they talked about where the best place was to go to church and about the water of life, but Jesus questioned, questioned her about her, uh, well, they talked about the best place to go to church, and Jesus said, it's not the place that's important about going to church. What God is really looking for is worshipers who will worship him in spirit and in truth. So we don't our we are connected body soul and spirit but it's with our spirit that we worship god that we know god that we understand the things of god paul says in first corinthians 2 the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of god for they are foolishness unto him neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned have you ever tried to witness to somebody and had somebody um, say to you that, I just don't understand that? Well, they don't. Without the Spirit of God, they can't understand spiritual things. Now, God will enlighten them. His Spirit will convict them. And if they receive Him as Lord, they will understand things. It always, um, I'm always tickled at uh, somebody who comes to know Christ as Savior and um, they're so excited and they read things in the Bible and they see things in the Bible and I've had people come to me and say, did you know it said that? And they were so excited because now they see, as John Newton wrote, I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. The soul and the spirit are connected, but they're different. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, and the very God of peace sanctify you holy. Paul says, I want God to set you apart, all of you apart. And he says, I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Solomon says, the spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord. Our spirit is the the King James says candle, but the word's translated more often than not as lamp. And there's a difference between a lamp and a candle. A candle burns up, but a, a lamp is filled with oil, and it can burn till that oil burns out, and you can fill it up again. And that's the picture of a Christian, really. Our spirit is filled with the Spirit of God, and that's how His will gets done in our lives is when his spirit fills our spirit. In the Bible, the Holy Spirit is pictured a lot of times as oil. And that oil of the spirit is what is to make us burn and to go and to glow and to shine for the Lord. Paul says in Romans 8, But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. And he goes on to say in verse 16, The spirit itself, God's spirit, bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So we're body, soul, and spirit. We're going to look at in a couple of chapters. In chapter 3, Adam sinned. And the Bible tells us that God walked with man in the cool of the day. But when Adam sinned, the Lord left the garden. 
And when the Lord went out, the light went out. And when the light went out, the life went out. And God told Adam, in the day that you eat of this tree, you will die. And he did die immediately in his spirit. He was separated from God. Progressively in his soul, he got worse and worse, as we can see today. And ultimately, he died in his body. When we're born again, we're made alive. We have eternal life immediately in our spirit. We're saved immediately, we say. We're saved progressively in our soul. We should be getting better. As the little boy said, I'm, I'm gooder than I used to be. We should be, by the grace of God, gooder than we used to be. As his spirit fills our spirit, we should be changed. And that would, one day, ultimately, our bodies will be changed. When we receive Christ, his spirit comes into us. And the Lord comes in. And when the Lord comes in, the light comes in. And when the light comes in, the life comes in. And one day, our bodies will be even changed to match our soul and our spirit. With the body, we know the world around us, the outward world. With our soul, we know the inward world. With our spirit, we know the upward world. I heard a story about an immigrant in the 1800s, and he was coming to uh, America from Europe. And he sold all of his possessions, really. Uh, we would say he liquidated his assets. And he sold everything he had, and he bought a diamond. And so all of his possessions were caught up in this diamond. He came by ship, as they did in those days, and came to... America, and on the way, he was out on the deck of the ship one day, and he had his little bag with his diamond in it, and he took it out, and it glistened in the sun, as you might imagine, on the deck of the ship. And as he took the diamond out, others began to see it, and it kind of built him up a little bit that others were watching, and they would sort of uh, see this miraculous stone that he had. Uh, it got to be sort of a um, I guess built his ego up and he began to enjoy people watching him take out his diamond and see it glisten in the sun. And so he began to go up on the deck and he would take the diamond out and people would see it and he began to move over even to the edge of the deck and hold it in his hands close to the edge. He even began to hold the diamond out over the edge of the ship. Then one day he got so bold that he tossed it up in the air and the people would gasp as to think that he would gamble with this diamond that represented his entire fortune. One day he was on the deck and he was holding the diamond over the edge and he pitched it up and the ship lurched and he missed it and the diamond fell and went into the waters of the Atlantic and sunk to the bottom. Some might say, well, I don't really believe that story. Nobody would be that foolish to have their whole possessions in one object and then gamble so with that one object and lose it. Well, I don't I don't know that that story is true or not. I, it's hard for me to believe somebody would do that as well. But it's even more unbelievable that somebody would gamble with their eternal soul. Jesus said, What would it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lost his soul? That wonderful creation that you are, body, soul, and spirit. And yet, thousands, millions of people reject Christ, the only hope for salvation. That's what we were created for. That's, if you will, our excuse for being born, that we could be with him 
He created us to be with him, body, soul, and spirit. And one day we will be with him. As Job says, I know one day in my flesh I will see him. Paul tells us in Corinthians we'll have a new body and our soul and spirit will be glorified with Christ and we will worship and praise him forever. Don't forget your excuse for being born. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you that you did create us body, soul, and spirit so that we could fellowship with you through all eternity. I pray, Lord, that you would help us not to gamble away our body, soul, and spirit, but that we would trust you and receive you as Lord. The Bible says if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe that you raised him from the dead, that we'll be saved. And whoever does that, whoever calls on the name of the Lord, will be saved. Lord, I pray if there's one tonight that doesn't know you, that they would call out to you and pray, Lord, save me. And your word tells us that you will. We thank you for that promise. We thank you for the story of creation. We thank you for the story of redemption and the new creation. We pray that you would be glorified, Lord, in your word. In Jesus' name, amen.